Today's stuff we're going to learn is Yoma Nun Chet. We're going to start at the from the bottom of Nun Zayin Amubet. What we saw yesterday was we got to the point where we finished. Let's just review. The Kohen Gadol sprinkles the blood of the bull inside. Then he slaughters the goat. Then he brings the blood inside also. Then he does the one up seven days. Then he comes outside. Now we're assuming, and we're going to discuss this again today. I'm going to hold the map north-south, even though the map will hold it upside down, um, so that north is at the top and south is at the bottom. So the Kohen is in the Kodesh Kodeshim. He sprinkles the blood, he comes out. He now has, remember, he has, let's say, the two pedestals or maybe one. Then he takes the blood of the bull again, and he sprinkles it toward the parochet. Now, we assumed, which is that barrier in between, right, whether there's one or two, there's a machloket. In this picture, there's two. If you remember, we assumed, where is he standing? Right in front of the parochet, okay? So on, right, on the other side of him is the menorah and the shulchan. And beyond that is the mizbah hazahav, which is the incense altar, which he's going to now sprinkle blood in when he's finished with this. So he's standing here, let's assume, and he sprinkles toward the parochet. Again, one up, seven down of the bull, then one up, seven down of the seir, of the goat. Then he goes to the mizbah hazahav, okay? So before he does that, and that's what we're up to, it says in the Mishnah, Ira dama par dama For the last sprinkling that he's going to do, or the last, we'll see, it's really two sets. He's going to mix the bloods together. That's what the Mishnah says, to which the Gemara said, by the way, this is only one opinion. Not everyone agrees that the bloods are mixed. And according to, we don't know yet who, but Rabbi Yoshi and Rabbi Yonatan have a machloket. One says you mix the bloods together and one says you don't. What the Pasuk had said in the Torah is, the midama pav umidama se'il. You take the blood from here and the blood from there and then you do the sprinklings. So does it mean when you say I'm taking this and this, does it mean together or does it not? So we said, well, the fact that there's a machloka between the two of them and we don't know who says what, let's assume that Rabbi Yoshi is the one who says it means together because he says in another case when it talks about cursing your parents, it says your mother and your father. And he explains that there it means both of them, even though it doesn't say together, that you'd only be obligated if you curse them both, to which he then says there's a different reason why we darshan that it's not true. And you're really obligated even just for cursing your mother or just for cursing your father. But from the simple reading of those words, et avi et imo, one would assume both together, even though it doesn't say together. And Rabbi Yonatan says, no, we assume separately unless it says together. So if that's the case, what would Rabbi Yonatan say by us? We'll assume separately because it didn't say together. It just says this and that, just like the father and the mother, the bull, the bull and the goat. And it doesn't say together. Rabbi Yosha would assume it's separate. And Rabbi, I'm sorry, Rabbi Yonatan would assume it's separate. And Rabbi Yoshia, who says, no, it means together, even if it doesn't say the word together, would say this is together. And that sounds pretty good and simple. But the last thing we saw in the Gemara was the Gemara rejected and said, no, maybe you could say even Rabbi Yonatan would say here that we don't care what we say in general, whether it means together or whether it means separate. Here, there's a separate verse that seems to imply that you would do it together. Forgetting about what you think about if this and that doesn't mean together or not, but it says echat, okay? It says once a year, in Shemot Lamed, it describes once a year, Right, that Aharon puts on the corners of that altar from the Dam Chatata Kippurim, from the sin offering of Yom Kippur, once. One sounds like one placing of the blood, which would mean one set of four placings, right, in each of the four corners, but only one time and not two times. So Rabbi Yonatan could say, maybe he sides on the side that we don't, that we do mix the blood. To which the Gemara says, starting from now the bottom of Nunzayan Amabet, Tanya de lo kashinu yan. But there's a Braita that doesn't go like we just said. In other words, we suggested that Rabbi Yoshaya held they're mixed, and Rabbi Yonatan said they're not, and then we rejected that and said not necessarily. But we're going to now go back to our original and say, in fact, there's a Braita that says explicitly, and first the Gemara brought up this machloket, we don't know who says what. But now someone quoted a bright and said, wait, but I have a bright where it says exactly who said what, and it's going to be exactly what we thought in the beginning. This is a quote from the bright. That means take the blood from here and from there, meaning put them together. Here you have it. He said, mix them. 
רבי יונתן אומר, מה זה בפני עצמו, מי זה בפני עצמו, מי זה בפני עצמו, רבי יונתן says no, the, the blood of the bull first, and then the blood of the goat, each one separate, take the blood from this and from that, and each one put on the altar separately. So that's the machloket, which now be clear who says what, and it's like we originally thought. This bright though goes into more of a discussion between them. It already says, meaning he quotes the verse that we quoted before to suggest that maybe Rabbi Yonatan would agree in this case, right? To say, or maybe he's the one who holds that it's together because it says once a year, to which Rabbi Yonatan responds, Rabbi Yonatan, Midam hapal umidam asil. It, but it says from the blood of the goat and the blood of the, uh, I'm sorry, from the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat, and doesn't say together. So sounds like separately. Im ken lamanem arachat. So he still has to address the question that Rabbi Yoshe asked, which is why does it say once? Lomar lecha achat velo shtayim midam hapal, achat velo shtayim midam asil. It means one set of the dam apal and one set of the dam seir, but each one separately. In other words, one means one set of bloods for each animal. Okay. So there you have it. Who says what? Tanya Idach, there's another bright to now we're going to quote, which also we'll see who this bright to goes by. This is going to quote only one opinion. And then the Gemara is going to say, clearly this bright was going with that one opinion. This teaches that they should be mixed. So you already know who's is this. This is Rabbi Yoshia. To which the Brita says, well, you said they should be mixed, but how, who's to say they should be mixed? Maybe from the verse you could assume this one separately and that one separately. So in this case, this Tana uses as the proof that this is the right way because it says one and one means only one set. So then, um, which means you mix them together. And then the Gemara says, Yoshia. this Stam source, right? That doesn't have a, a name attached to it must be Rabbi Yoshia's opinion who holds that they're mixed together. So again, we assume that all along that at this point, the bloods get mixed together. And many studio talk about the bloods getting mixed together. Right. We talked about how they law, learn laws of nullification, of min bimino. There's a whole debate about it, but that you mix them and yet they're called the Dhamma Par and the Dhamma Seir. That's all according to Rabbi Yoshia's approach. According to Rabbi Yonatan, they're actually still kept separate. Now we're going to move on to another question. This question doesn't have to do with our, our case. However, the Gemara is going to connect it and try to use our mission as a way to get an answer to this question. Natana tamale berekan. What if you put, oh, I'm sorry, this is the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, what do you do? You put the, the what you first you started with two cups. You had the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat. Then you poured one into the other. It doesn't say which into which, it doesn't really matter. And then you end up with one empty cup and one full cup. Now, what do you do? You take the full cup and you dump it back into the empty cup, okay? So the question really is, why do you do that? And what is this coming to teach you? So now the, Rami Barhama asks the question of Rav Chista. The structure right now is going to be, Rami Barhama asks the question of Rav Chista. We're going to try to prove it from our Mishnah. We're not going to be successful. We're going to try to prove it from somewhere else. We're not going to be successful. Then someone's going to suggest that the question that Rami Barhama asked Rav Chista was really something else. And then they're going to bring an answer to that question. And then they're going to go to a different question that Rami Barhama asked Rav Chista. So it's basically, it's kind of three questions, but two are just different versions of did he say, ask this question or did he ask that question? So Rami so, Rami Barhama asked Rav Chista the following question. What if you put, you collect the blood for an animal, we're just talking about a regular animal, and you go to the altar to put that blood on the altar. That's normally what you do. You collect it in a, in a kli called a mizrach. It's kind of like a bowl. And you put it in there and then you walk it to the altar, right? That's Kabbalah and then Holacha. And then you do the Zrika. Those are the main actions, rituals in the temple after the slaughtering. He says, what if you had a bowl within a bowl, a Mizrach within a Mizrach, and then the blood? Now we've learned all along, we're gonna learn this much more so in Zachim, you can't have any sort of separation barrier between the Kohen and the work that he's doing. 
So is this cup stacked into the, or this bowl cup stacked into the other bowl or cup or whatever it is, is it, right? It's kind of like something I would say probably in between a cup and a bowl. Is it a chatzitza or not? Is this a problem? Because the coin's holding the, the bowl and the blood is in a different bowl that's inside this bowl. Now, do you say, Mim bimino chotzeitz? Oh, I know chotzeitz. Since it's just another Mizrak, it's the same exact thing. Maybe that's what we call Mim bimino. It's the same type. Maybe it doesn't, it's not considered a barrier. Or do you say it is? Okay. Or maybe it is chotzeitz. So the question is, does this create a separation, which would then mean that whatever the Kohen did was disqualified because he wasn't directly holding the blood, right? Obviously, he's not directly holding the blood, he needs it to be in a utensil. But now we have a utensil and a utensil. Is that a problem? Amrle, Tani Tua, let's learn it from our Mishnah. What does it say in our Mishnah? Natana Tamale Berekan. Now, the way I explained it was you dump the blood back into the other cup, the empty one. But they're reading this Mishnah differently. The way they read the mission is my love. It does it not mean when you say you put the full one, Natana Tamale Berekan, the full one into the empty one, does it not mean my love, Hoshiv Mizrak Male Litoch Mizrak Rekan? Does it not mean you stack them? Right? Because maybe we want the Kohen to be carrying what they thought originally in this mission was. The idea is you want the Kohen to go in holding both cups. How are you going to do that? Well, stack them. Put the full one inside the empty one, right? Imagine like you're clearing the dishes, you stack them up and you bring them in or you, you want to set the table. Let's use that as a better example because here we're not clearing away, but you want to set the table. The best way to do it is stack your glasses if you can, right? Sometimes they get stuck inside each other, but assume you have glasses that can be stacked. You stack them up and you bring them to the table. So likewise here, he's going to bring it to the altar. He wants both bowls with him. So he stacks them up one inside the other. So isn't that what's going on? In which case, clearly it's not a problem of a chatzitza because that's what he does. So the Gemara says, no, 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 you misunderstood the Mishnah. Lo. No, you empty it. You dump it back into the other one and then you leave the other Mizrach. You don't use it. So now they say, wait, if you want to say that he dumps the full one into the empty one, well, that doesn't make any sense. Because Hatan Ali Reisha, it already said that in the beginning. It said, Ira dama parla toch dama seir. Meaning it didn't say you did that, but it said, again, you have two bowls with blood in them. You pour one into the other. Once you pour one into the other, you've already mixed them. What's the point of pouring them back into the empty one? It's a useless activity. The whole idea is to mix them. You've already mixed them. What's the point? So it doesn't make sense to say, and that's why they must have thought that you stack the bowls, because it makes no sense to say that you dump from one into the other and then back into the original one. It doesn't make into the first one. It doesn't make sense. But the Gemara says, no, 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 it does make sense. You want the blood to really get mixed, because what's the issue? Well, when you go to the altar, let's say the blood of the par you dump into the blood of the seer. You end up, some of the blood might remain at the top. And when the coin puts in his finger to go around the altar, he's going to end up without the blood being mixed properly. So we all know that if you want to mix something well, you pour it from cup to cup and cup to cup, and that's a good way to do it. So therefore, it must be, it does mean to dump it back into the other cup. It has nothing to do with this question then about whether stacking the cups is going to create a chatzitsa situation, a separation and a problem, because that's not what this is talking about, in which case we have no answer to our question. Gemara tries to bring a second answer, a second source to possibly learn an answer to the question. But as I told you before, they're not going to be successful. Tashma. Let's learn from here. Haya omed al gabe kli, al gabe regal chabero, pasul. Here's another case of a chatzitza. The coin's supposed to stand directly on the ground. If he stands on top of a kli, like let's say there's a, a step, you know, some sort of you know, like I'm thinking of those aerobic steps or, you know, there's some sort of something on the ground and he steps on that while he's doing the work in the temple or he steps, is a little more strange, al gabe regel chabero, on top of his friend's foot, okay? He puts his foot on their foot. Pasu, his work is disqualified. Now, on the kli doesn't really matter because that's what we call min b'she'eno mino. That's two different things. Makes sense, it would be a, a separation. But his foot on his friend's foot, that is what we call mim bimino. That's like cup inside a cup. And what do you see here? It's disqualified. So it must be you can't use a cup inside a cup, just like you can't use a foot on top of a foot. 
right? Each one is the same kind of category of same type. So what do they say? No, that doesn't prove anything. Shane Regel, and here's a great line, de lomate nevatele. You can't just nullify a foot. Okay, a foot is something important. It belongs to someone. You can't just say, let's imagine this doesn't exist. Okay, a cup, a utensil, you could sort of say, we imagine this doesn't exist. But a, but a foot, you can't just say, oh, let's just ignore this person's foot. So because of that, laws of nullification don't apply. This is, by the way, why we have this big problem with bugs, right? Bugs in food. Why bugs in food? Because if you have a, right, normally we say, right, 60th. 60 times the amount of, right? So let's say you have a teeny little bug in your soup and you accidentally eat the bug or, you know, in your cauliflower or whatever, and you have a worm, you eat it, shouldn't be a problem because it's bato, but it's not nullified. Why is it? Because it's called a bria. It's whole. Anything that's whole has significance to it. Okay. So therefore, if it's whole, right, if it's chopped up, right, a little unpleasant to think about, it's okay. Kosher's wise, you might not want to be eating it anyway, but it's already, you can have laws of betel as long as you have 60 against it. But if it's whole, it has significance. And there's all sorts of laws relating to nullification that we've seen before, we'll see again, about something being significant, you can't just nullify it. So here also, you can't just say it's as if it doesn't exist. And that's why it's a chatzitza, but with the bowls or the cups, it's not really an issue. Okay, so now, um, the next question, Becky, I think this really addresses what you're asking, which is, some people say that wasn't the question. The question that Rami Barham asked Rav Chiste about this cup inside a cup didn't have to do with, is it a chatzitza, a separation or not, even though, right, if it's the same thing, do we view it as if it's really not there and therefore it's not a separation or is it a separation anyway? But the question was, is this, right, exactly what you were saying, Becky, is this the way we're supposed to do a voda carrying, stacking them, right? So let's go back to our, our image of setting the table. If you're at the table of the king, okay, you go to king's house and you go to this beautiful feast and normally the whole table's set. Let's say for whatever reason, the glasses weren't on the table yet. And the, the servers come in and they bring, you know, the waiters, waitresses, they come in and they come to the table with glasses stacked up and start dividing them up. Like that would be very strange, you would say. Um, the fact that they bring cups to the table may be a strange to begin with, but okay, if they bring a glass for you and a glass for the next person separately, that would be appropriate. But to have them stacked looks like you're trying to do things quickly or you're trying to, you know, figure out a way to do two in one. Like I always go back to my, my daughter and the one trip challenge, right? Get everything off the table in one shot. That's not something you do in the temple. That's not the way, right? You're not trying to quickly finish and do things in that kind of efficient manner. You are trying to be efficient, but not in a disrespectful manner. So, right, it, and I should say about the one trip challenge, we always have this argument because husbands of the opinion, you shouldn't ever stack. In his house, they never stack, gets things dirty more. And the, so he goes with the approach, this is respect, right? You have to treat the dishes with respect or however you might say it, but it's not respectful to stack, right? It's stacking your plates in front of other people also. It's not, it's not a way to do it. So that's the question. And that was the question, not about chatzitza. The question was about Derek Shirud or not to which we're actually gonna have an answer to this question, right? Already in the first set, we tried to answer one from our mission, one from somewhere else, we couldn't get an answer. Here we're gonna say, they're gonna quote a bright from the answer of Rabbi Yishmael. So here it's a verse that's discussing in Sefer Bamibar chapter four, when they're talking about all the, the things the Levim carried, they took clay hasharet. Now, clay is, plural, it means kalim vessels, the vessels that were used for serving. So what did they see here? Shnei kalim v'sherut echad, two vessels, and one, it was said in, in, in a singular form, sherut, which means you can use two vessels for one sherut, and actually it's not disrespectful, it's according to what they say, and you could do that. Okay, next. So as I said, this was two versions of Rami Barham's question to Rav Chista. Now we're going to have a separate question that Rami Barham asked Rav Chista. Similar. What if you put something with like fibers in it, like uh, fibers from the, from the palm tree? Okay, so it's something that the liquid can go through. So what if at the bottom of your cup, you had these fibers inside? 
and you put it inside and then kibel bo etadam. Do we say, now here, this is not mim bimino, it's mim b'she'en omino. It's two different things. Now that's usually more of a problem. Mim b'she'en omino chotzetz, oino chotzetz. Do we say, mim she'en omino is always going to be a problem? Or maybe we say in this case, it's not. Why not? Do we say, since the blood can get through to the bottom of the bowl, can go right through these fibers, maybe it's not a problem. Or do we say, no, it doesn't matter. It's still a chatzitza. So Amarle, Tanina, he says, let's learn it from the following Mishnah. This is a Mishnah Masechet Para that's describing if you take a trough and you fill it with the mechatat, and in that trough, there's a sponge and there's water that's collected in that sponge. So they say, You can use the water that's in there, even though there's a sponge in there, but the water that was collected in the sponge can't be used. That water is disqualified because it's not considered in the kli, it's in the sponge. That's a problem. It has to be in the kli. It says, if you remember, when you pour the water on the ashes, it has to be mayim chayim el keli, it says, in the kli. The water has to be in the vessel. The sponge, the water in the sponge is in the sponge and not in the vessel. So any water that's in the sponge can't be used, but the water that's not in the sponge and not mixed with the water that's in the sponge is actually okay. So what do you see here? You see that it's not a chatzitza. It's still considered in the vessel, even though there's a sponge in the way because it can go right through the sponge. So therefore they say, we can learn from there that it's not a chatzitza. It doesn't create a separation. To which the Gemara says, no, shani maya de klisha. Blood is much thicker than water. So the blood might not go through as well. Water is very thin. It goes through very easily, but the blood might not go through as well. And therefore we might distinguish between water and blood. And therefore we don't have an answer. But Ika de Amr, some people say, Hachi Pashina. No, they actually gave an answer, a different answer. And the answer was, Bidam Kasher Bekomets Pasu. When you're talking about blood, it's going to, it's fine because the blood will go through. Okay. When you talk about blood and water, maybe there's a little bit of difference in the thickness, but there's still liquids and they'll still really go through. But when you're talking about the comets, now what's the comets? Remember, you do the Kmitsa, you take the dough, right? This, this flour mixed with a little bit of oil that's kind of in a dough form. And you do a kmitza and you take it and you put it in a klishare. Again, it has to be directly in the klishare. If there's a, there's a sieve at the bottom of these fibers, the dough is thick. It's not going to go through. So we distinguish between blood, like something liquid and something more solid. So the solids won't go through, but the liquid will. Okay. That's the end of that section. Now we're back to sprinkling the blood on this outer altar. Okay, so now we're going to use our map. It's going to help us a lot. So if you have your map, take it out. Okay, again, if you put it north, south, instead of south, north, you hold it upside down, it's a little easier to follow, especially because we're going to talk a lot about directions. Yet the Mishnah starts off and says, So he leaves, remember, he had left the Kodesh Kodeshim. Now he's in front of the Parochet. And now he goes to the altar. And we're going to see later that he even has to pass the altar. And he goes all the way to the eastern side of the room. If you remember the altar, if you don't have the picture of the map, I'll just describe to you. If you remember, it's the first thing you get to when you go into the room from the east, right? First, it's centered in the room. And then you have the shulchan and the menorah on either side further into the room. But the first thing, so he has to walk all the way beyond the Mizbah HaZahav to the other side of the Mizbah HaZahav on the east side. So Yatzala Mizbah HaSher Lefnei Hashem, he goes out to the altar that's before God. Now you might think, Maybe he has to go all the way out to the outer altar. They say, no, no, no. Zem is bachazahav. We're talking about the golden altar that's in the sanctuary. Kitchil mechate v'yored. If you want to open the pictures, you can look at pictures. You can see the Kohen standing there with his finger full of blood. And he goes to the corners and he goes downward. He goes in a downward motion. Mehechanu matchil. From which corner does he start? So we're going to see different opinions about this. But in our Mishnah, we're going to see kind of two opinions. Later, we'll see a third opinion. So he walked out, okay, he goes to the eastern side of the altar. He's standing on the eastern side. Now, according to this opinion, he's standing on the north side. Now, why the north side of the room? Because if you remember, there's a debate, are there two parochot or just one? If there's one, then where's the opening? On the north side. So this opinion, which we're going to see is Rabbi Yossi Aglili, is going to hold like Rabbi Yossi, who we saw in the Mishnah, who said that there's only one parochet, in which case it's on the north. So he goes out the north, he sprinkles toward the parochet, but he still, I guess, stays somewhat toward the north, even though he was kind of more in the center of the room. But since he was on the north to begin with, so he stays north 
and he goes to the east past the Mizbech and he's still standing on the northern side. So he starts north. Now, what does he do first? The eastern one, the eastern corner, because that's where he's standing. So he starts Mikere Mizrachit Tzvonit, northeast. Then he goes Tzvonit Maravit. Okay, then he goes back into the room toward the west, toward the Kodesh Kodeshim, and does the next one. Then he's going to move, right? He's got to go around all four corners. Okay, so he's going to go, sorry, northwest, then southwest, right? Dromit uh, Maravit, and then Dromit Mizrachit, southeast. Now, what direction is he going? So look carefully, he's going counterclockwise. Okay, remember we have that whole thing when you get up the ramp. You go Yamin, right? All the peyote doughs are always Yamin, and then he's going to go around counterclockwise because he starts Yamin, right? It's always to his right. He goes counterclockwise. So this matches that perfectly. Later in the Gemara, we're going to see where Kiva has the opposite approach. He's going to go clockwise, and he's going to start in the south instead of the north. Okay, we'll try to figure out why that is. Now, he ends where? On the Dromit Mizrahi, the southeast corner. Now they just make a comment about this. The place where he ends here, which is southeast, is the same place where he starts on the altar that's outside. Because what did I just tell you? You go up the ramp and you turn right. Now, when you turn right up the ramp, because the ramp, right, remember, the, the Mizbeach, where the ramp goes south-north, right? So you go up from the south direction, you climb up the ramp, you turn right, right is to the east. So you're going to go east and you're going to be on the southern side because the ramp is from the south. So that's where you start when you're on the outer altar. It happens to be the place where you finish on the inner altar. Okay, that's just kind of a comparison. Haya, I don't think there's so much meaning to it, although maybe one can ascribe meaning to it, but maybe it's also just saying that the inner altar, things are very different than the outer altar. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, here's a different opinion. So now, according to this first opinion, we didn't exactly discuss this, but what does it mean he goes from the corner to corner? He walks around. Okay, now remember, this is a very small altar. It's one by one cubit, okay, one cubit squared. That's it. Very small. Cubit is not a lot, right? So very small. Now, he walks around it and goes from corner to corner in the directions that we just said in this counterclockwise direction. Rabbi Eliezer says, Bim komohaya omeru mechate. He stands in one place and he does the blood on all four corners from where he's standing. Okay, he doesn't really talk about the order, but he just says you stand in one place. It seems like, according to him, you're actually standing in between the parochet and the altar or in between the menorah, the shulchan and the altar. And you're over there and then you put it on all four corners. It's not really clear where he's standing, according to him. Sorry, all of them go upward. Remember, according to the first opinion, you go downward. All of them go upward. Other than the one that's directly where he's standing, that one has to go downward. Why? The concern is if you go upward, the blood will spring, splatter onto his clothes, which we don't want. If you go downward, you'll prevent it from doing that. So, According to the first opinion, you walk around the altar, everyone's going to be down so that you don't splatter on yourself. But if you're standing in one place and going around the altar, the ones that are far away, we're not really concerned that you're going to, it's going to spray on you. So therefore we spray up, we, we, you know, kind of do the streak of blood going upward, but the one in front of you, you go downward. That seems very practical. Right? Remember we said there's some that have meaning, there's some that are practical. Anyway, so he says that. There's one complication with this. And if you look at the pictures, you'll see there's coals on the altar. So it's a little bit dangerous that he's putting his hands over the coals. Now it could be the coals are from the morning service and maybe it's burnt out already and it's not really smoking up and it's not hot anymore. It's a possibility, but it's a little bit strange to stretch your arms across where there's something hot there. Okay, we're not gonna get into that though. It's just a point to think about. When he's finished with the four corners of the altar, either which way he did it, and like I said, we're going to see a third way in the Gemara. He's sheva pami. Now he's going to sprinkle on the top of the base of the altar. This was on the corners. If there's a karen in, in each corner, like a little corner thing. Now he's going to go onto the base of the altar, the top of it. He's going to sprinkle seven times. Then what does he do? Now, he always has blood left. Remember, we talked the other, yesterday about the remainder of the blood. So, Yisod was this ledge, okay, on the ground. 
that went around the altar. Okay, here's the picture. It went around the altar on the west, on the north side and on the west side. Okay, so it's this line and this line. It jutted out one ama, but only on two sides. But if you notice on this side, on the west side, it goes below, like toward the south. You see that? There's these black dots. There happen to be two black dots. I don't know if you can see them well here, but there's two black dots. There were two holes at the base of the isode on the western side toward the south side, right? Because here's the south. So in the direction of the south side of the, right? So the southernmost part of the western part of the isode, there were these two holes. Now, one is called Ma'aravi and one is called Dromi because one is, you would just say, on the, on the west side. And the one that's more south of that, that's lower, is going to be called the Dromi one. This picture shows it in one way. Some people actually have a little thing that jutted out and went a little more eastward, and that's why it's called south and not west. But either which way, however you have it, there were two holes. One was more south, southern than the other. So which one do you put the blood into? The one that was more south. I'm um, sorry, the one that was more, that was west, that was really more north than the southern one. But they point out, again, another difference between this and the When you took from the, when you have blood left over from placings of the blood that happened on the outer altar, which is not what's going on here, you would put it in that other one, the one that was more to the south. Elu the Elu, but all of them, mitarvim ba'ama, get mixed up in um, in the gutter, right? They, where does it go from that hole? Where does the hole go to? So it goes to the gutter. It leads to this gutter that was on the ground and that was on the floor of the temple. And it goes out to Nachal Kidron. Shulam Mishkin wrote this week in flashback all about Nachal Kidron. So if you want to know more about it, you can read it there. It seems like you could take the blood out of the water once it gets to the Nachal and you could sell it to as fertilizer, okay? You would have to kind of redeem it with money, okay? That's how you would do it. You would pay money. It would take the sanctity out of the blood and then it could be used for, for fertilizing. But if you don't sell them, then you don't sell that blood. That blood has a law of mi'ila. It's misuse of, you would, be, you would be liable for misuse of consecrated property if you didn't redeem it with money. That's an aside. Now we're gonna start the Gemara with Brighton. We're going to start with exactly where was the coin standing. We're going to see the different opinions about how he went when he did these sprinkling, the placements of the blood on the outer, on the inner altar, the Mizbah Hazahab. Tano Rabbanan, Vyatsa Ala Mizbah. I just want to remind you, this is called the golden altar. It's also called the Mizbah HaKtoret, the incense altar, right? It has two names. And it actually has three names because sometimes they call it the Mizbah HaPnimi, the inner one. So it's got three different names. They're all the same thing. Yatzal is back. So now it says, and he goes out to the altar, Asher the Pnei Hashem. So now they ask, why does it have to tell you that he went out to the altar? Obviously, he's going to put it on the altar. So where else would he be? That's what we call the Par Halem Gavar Shel Tzibor. The bull offering that you do also on the inner altar, and you also have to do sprinklings on the parochet or toward the parochet. So it's very similar. And there, there's one major difference. We're going to see where they get this from in two minutes. But right now, they're going to just assume you know this. That when it comes to the parabal kol mitzvot, shekohen omed chutz lemizbech, umazeh la parochet b'sha'ashu humazeh. When the kohen sprinkles the blood on the parochet, when he's doing it from the parhalem devar shel tzibor, he stands on the eastern side of the altar, far from the parochet. Okay? He basically has right, a lot of things in between. He's got the incense altar, which is kind of in his line of vision because you assume he's standing in the center of the room. Further in, he's got the menorah and the, and the shulchan, the table and the candelabra. And he basically has to sprinkle the blood, right? He's got to have a good throw, sprinkle it from right, the eastern side of the altar all the way to the parochet. So you might've thought that maybe on Yom Kippur, it's the same thing. Maybe he needs to also be standing all the way over there. It never said in the Torah where he's supposed to be standing. It just says he leaves the Kodesh Kodeshim and then he sprinkles on the parochet. So we assumed all along that he was standing right next to the parochet. But now they say, maybe not. Maybe he's standing on the other side of the altar. So they say, huh, that's why it says, 
right? So Yahal, so here, let's just keep reading. I think, I, I'm not sure I read this whole thing inside. So Lafisha Matzina Bupara he stands on the far side of the altar. And he sprinkles from afar. You might have thought also Yom Kippur, it's the same thing. He tells you after you do the sprinklings on the parochet, you then go out to the altar, meaning you weren't standing by the altar before, meaning you were standing like we thought you were near the parochet. So where could you have been? You could have only been on the other side of the Mizbech. There's no way you were on the eastern side of the altar. You must have been on the western side, much closer to the parochet. Now we're going to have a bright that shows how we know that the Parhalim Dabar Shel Tzibur, you were standing on the other side of the altar, the far side. Tanya Idach, another bright says, Lifnashem, this is a pasuk about the sprinkling, it's in Vayikra Dalib when they're talking about the Parhalim Dabar Shel Tzibur. So it says here, um, Matamudlama, why does it say before God? We're going to see exactly in what context it says it there in a minute. Now here he's starting in the reverse. Since we already learned from Yom Kippur that Yatzal is Mizbech, so it must be when he was doing the sprinklings on the parochet, he was standing near the parochet and not on the other side of the Mizbech because only after he goes to the Mizbech. And you might think the same is true for the Parhalim Davar Shel Tzibor. Tamud Lomar, Mizbech Toret HaSamim Lifnei Hashem Asher Ba'omoed says you should do it on the Mizbach, it says, I'll read the beginning of the verse. He puts the blood on the, on the altar of Mizbach HaKtoret Tasamim Lifne Hashem. It's actually not talking about the spring on the parochet, but it says he puts the blood on the Karnon of Mizbach. And it says, but what's important here, it says the Mizbach HaKtoret is Lifne Hashem, which they darshan to say, Mizbach Lifne Hashem ve'en Kohen Lifne Hashem. The altar is before God, but not the Kohen. The Kohen's not standing before God. Okay? So therefore, how could that be? How could he not be before God? It must be the Mizbech is separating between him and God. By the way, this is again, the same idea of Chatzitza, right? There's this separation. And what's also going on here that's similar to what we were just doing is there's a lot of comparisons. There's comparing the Mizbech HaChitzon to the Mizbech HaPnimi that we saw in the Mishnah. There's comparing the Par Halem Davar Shel Tzibor and the Par Kohen HaGadol B'Yom HaKipulim. There's a lot of comparisons. Now we're going to get to how he does the blood and what direction he walks. So the Brita says, So he starts to do his sprinklings, right, in the downward motion, because we're talking about the opinion. We're now not getting back to Rabbi Leezer, who says he just stands in one place and does it from there. We're talking about the opinion that he walks around and encircles the altar as he goes. From where would he start? This is different from what we saw before. According to Rabbi Akiva, we're on the south side, right? Why would we be on the south side? Because if you remember the way we described it, what happened? You walked out from Kodesh Kodeshim, the always the parochets on the north. But if you have two parochot, remember he walked in between the curtains and then he gets out on the south side. So he's already on the south side. He goes to the southeast because he's got to go all the way to the other side of the altar. So he starts southeast. Then he goes southwest. Then he goes northwest. And then he goes northeast. Okay. So notice when he does this. Okay. So south. And then he goes this way. Notice what direction he's going. The other direction. He's going clockwise. Okay. So we're going to have to understand Rabbi Akiva because it doesn't seem to match what we know not from what we saw in the Mishnah and not from what we know to be that you're always supposed to go derech yimim, which means clock, counterclockwise. Rabbi Yossi Aglili Omer, and this is exactly what we saw before in the Mishnah, mi kerem mizrachit tzfonit, you start in the Northeast, tzfonit maravit, maravit, tromit, romit, mizrachit. Okay, so you go from Northeast to Northwest, to Southwest, to Southeast. And now again, they're playing the comparison game. Each one starts in the place where the other one finishes, and each one finishes in the place where the other one starts. Okay, they each have kind of opposite approaches. Now, however, let's talk about what they both agree about. Everyone agrees. They all agree that you don't start at the place. You know, what do you hit when you're first, when you're walking? 
whether you're on the north side or whether you're on the south side, it doesn't matter. Where do you hit first on the altar? First, you get to the western side. Nobody agrees that you start on the western side. And the question is, why? And if they both agree you start on the east, it's just a matter of where you go from there. And where, whether it's north-south, and then where you go from there. There's two disagreements, really. So, but they all agree that you that you basically pass over. Now, this is an issue because, and we're going to see it inside later, we say, when you have an option to do a mitzvah, you don't pass up your, your, your possibility. You don't just ignore it. So why didn't he just start right there? When he got there first, he should immediately do the mitzvah when you get there. So why is that? My time. When it says, you have to go out to the altar, the way they explain it is, you have to go beyond the Mizbech. You have to pass the whole Mizbech. When it says go out to the altar from where you were standing on the other side of it, right? You have to pass it and get to the other side. Everybody agrees that that's what it means. Because the Torah says it, you have to go all the way to the other side. Then you can start. Ule Rabbi Akiva, here comes our other question. Nakif So the Gemara doesn't get into why one starts on the north and one starts on the south. That we kind of figured out. But they say, why don't you do go in counterclockwise, like we always go in the temple? So they suggest, Lema, why don't we say, maybe they have a debate about whether or not they agree with what Rami Bar Yechezkel says. What did Rami Bar Yechezkel say? Rami Bar Yechezkel, he's the one who came up with this idea of Yamin. And where does he get it from? Yam Shasa Shlomo, remember this Yam of Shlomo? It was this um, Kiyor, the special sink that was in the temple. It were like a water basin. It was like a, it was almost a mikvah type thing. This yam shasa shlomo omer al shnei masar bakal. There were twelve cattle. Shlosha ponim tzafona. Shlosha ponim yama. Shlosha ponim negba. Shlosha ponim mizracha. Now the way it describes it in the verses: three are facing north, three are facing west, three are facing south, and three are facing east. Okay, so you have this yam that Shlomo did. This thing that has water in it. At the base of it, there's statues of these of these animals, these cattle that are facing, and then they describe it. And when they go in this description, they're describing the counterclockwise order. The so the yam is the mala, the water's on top, the cholacharehem baita, their outsides, um, right, their backs are facing inside, I guess. Hala, right, so you, their faces are facing outside. Hala madita, what do you learn from here? So from here, you see, we always go counterclockwise as this description. So you could say, right? It's not like he makes the most convincing argument in the world. You could say, maybe Rabbi Kiva doesn't hold to him. So the Gemara says, no, not possible. Everybody agrees with him. But, now remember, where do we learn this all? About the outer altar. When you go up that ramp, where do you go? You go you mean, and then you end up counterclockwise from there because you have no other way to go, right? You can't go clockwise. There's nowhere to go clockwise there. So now they say, maybe the machloket is, Riosi says, we're going to learn about the inner altar from the outer altar. And, and as we, they all agree with Rambi Bar when it comes to the outer altar, but there's a debate regarding the inner altar. Rabbi Akiva doesn't hold that we learn the inner altar from the outer altar. So the same rules don't apply. So then they say, wait a minute. But then Rabbi Akiva doesn't make sense. Why? For Rabbi Akiva, let's assume his thing is based on that we don't learn inside from outside, if that's the case. It might be you don't learn inside from outside, but well, then it shouldn't matter what direction you go. If we don't have anywhere to learn it from, then it, he could go anyway. So why does Rabbi Kiva say specifically you have to go this way, right? He, he was very specific about the order. So we say, um, he could explain, you really should have started from the Western, right? Now, again, Rabbi Akiva has you standing in the South. So you should have started with Southwest. That's really where you should have started because that's where you got to first. As Rish Lakish said, and we've seen this earlier in the Masechet, that you can't pass up an opportunity for a mitzvah. So you really should have started there. What's the problem? Am I low, Avi? Why didn't you? Because it says you're supposed to go out of the altar, out to the altar, meaning go beyond the altar. So you have to go to the east. So you have to pass over. Now, which one did you pass? Right? If you're walking on the south side, 
you passed first the Dromit Maravit and you got to the Dromit Mizrahi, the southeast. But Adinafit Mikulim is Bech, right? So Yatsalam is Bech, you have to pass the Mizbech. So you have to get to the east first. But since Kevan de Yad, Bahu Karen, once you do the east on the south side, what should you do next? Hadar Ate Lahu Karen de Ichayab Lameta Beresha. You should go back to the one that you passed over, right? If you start going counterclockwise, you'll only end up there at the end. And that's the one that you passed over. And it's not nice to pass over a mitzvah. So go right back and do that one. Well, once you did that one, then just continue in that direction, which is the clockwise direction. And that's why, in other words, he doesn't have a reason to go clockwise specifically because of any reason. But he has a different reason, which is once you do southeast, you should move back to southwest, which is the one you pass, and then continue from there. And that will take you in a clockwise direction. Okay, so that's the explanation. We're going to have a little bit more. Um, we're going to have another answer tomorrow and continue in the sugya for a little bit more. Have a great day, everyone.